So Joel, our community pastor, is going to bring the word tonight and then challenge us with some questions, and then he's going to talk a little bit more, challenge us with a few more questions. Uh, so yeah, and we're walking through Genesis 1 through 3 this semester, so we're going to be in chapter 2 tonight, but I'm going to give it away to you. Thank you, Sid. All right, you guys, thanks so much for coming tonight, especially if it's your first time. Uh, we welcome you. Uh, We're really grateful that you're here. If it's not your first time, thanks for coming back. Uh, If you have a Bible, let's turn to Genesis chapter 2. The verses will be on the screen, but if you have a Bible, I would love for you to turn there. So what I would like to do, I would like to talk to you for a few moments about a garden and a girl. Uh, Before we jump into that exciting content, um, what I would like to do is lay a little bit of groundwork that I don't know if it'll be the most helpful. I hope it will be. I believe it will be. Otherwise, I wouldn't share it. But as I was thinking about this text, this is something that I have found helpful to know. And uh, I've pastorally over the years encountered a lot of people who have stumbled over this. And so one of the things I would want you to do is if you have your Bible, this is not on the screen. So this is just for you to have a physical copy of your Bible or your Bible put up on the phone. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 4, there's a heading. My Bible says, and it's actually not at the beginning of verse 4, it's in the middle of verse 4. There's a heading. It's a weird place to put a heading. Does anybody have a heading in the middle of verse 4? What does it say? Okay. We are scoring low on participation (laughs) thus far. Okay. Doesn't have a heading? Okay. Is that the beginning of verse 4? Okay. Mine's like in the middle of the verse. Interesting. What does it say? The creation of man and woman. Anybody have something different than that? Adam and Eve. Eve. Seems legit. Anybody have something different than those two things? The man and woman in Eden. All this is good. All right, listen to what mine says. Does anybody have something different that you want to share than what you've heard? Man and woman in the garden. Sounds awesome. The account of creation. Okay, we're getting close. Here's what mine says, and this is weird. Um, And maybe I need to choose a different translation or something. Mine says, another account of the creation. Another account of the creation. Here's why this is important, Uh, and you may have already noted this, but if you're new to the scriptures or if you didn't, like, read all of chapter 1 and all of chapter 2, you may not know this, but um, chapter 1 and chapter 2 are both creation accounts, and they differ significantly, right? And so one of the things um, that I wanted to do was to lay a little groundwork about how do we account for those differences. This is not going to be a part of your discussion, I don't think, unless you just go off the script, which is fine by me. Uh, If you just love this and this is what you want to talk about, great. I just want you to have a great discussion. But I did not give you questions about this. Nevertheless, I did think it was important to address How do we account for the differences between Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2? So to spare you from having to read all of chapter 1 and all of chapter 2 and then compare the two, I noted a couple of differences for you. Uh, In Genesis chapter 1, you may remember that uh, the scene begins with darkness, right? And that's representative of chaos and disorder. And we have too much water in Genesis chapter 1. So we have darkness plus too much water, and then we have animals being created, among other things, then humans. That's Genesis chapter 1. That's not everything in there, but this is some of the differences. Genesis chapter 2, you may have noted. We have wilderness instead of darkness. Also indicative of chaos and disorder. Instead of having too much water in Genesis chapter 2, we don't have enough water. Don't know if you noticed. And then you may also have noted that in Genesis chapter 2, humans come before animals in Genesis chapter 2. So these are not small differences. And they should be accounted for, in my opinion. Um, There's a few different options, at least a few. There's probably a lot more than a few. I thought I would just give you a few tonight. 
Um, one of the interpretive options for the differences to account for them in Genesis 1 and 2 is to, and this is probably um, in academia, non-Christian academia, um, the preferred option is to say that these are two basically different stories from two different authors. So two sources theory. This is how to account for these differences in Genesis. That's one possible solution is the reason that they're so different is because two different people wrote them and they're actually two different accounts. Option number one, door number one. Door number two is cram all of Genesis chapter two into day six. This is the preferred option by many people who, um, and I really want to speak charitably, mostly because I've been this person who had to find a way to reconcile all the problems in ways that created a bunch more problems. So I'm speaking about my former self, so I want to speak charitably and non-judgmentally, but there's a tendency to want to jam everything in chapter two into day six to try to make everything fit together and resolve problems. But what ends up happening is you do solve some problems by doing that, but you create a whole host of new, darn near unresolvable problems, in my opinion. So I don't think jamming everything into day six is the best option. I don't think that these were written necessarily two different, totally different accounts by two totally different authors. That's not mine. So that brings us to door number three. What accounts for the differences in chapter one and chapter two and how can we understand them? And then why is that relevant for what we're gonna look at in chapter two? I believe that chapter one and chapter two are very different because they're looking at the same situation from two different perspectives. One thing that I believe is happening, and this is really, to me, it's an inescapable structure of Genesis chapter one and chapter two. I believe that Genesis chapter one is talking about how God brings order to the cosmos. Cosmic order coming into reality is what's happening in Genesis chapter one. And in Genesis chapter two, it's a story about how order is coming into terrestrial life or life on earth. So we're looking at two different things basically. It's the same thing, but at two different layers, if that makes sense. And to me, that doesn't solve every single problem. I don't think that's like the silver bullet of all things, but that's a way that makes a lot of sense to me. I can see that structure and harmonize it. And so it's relevant to us for a couple of reasons. Number one, I didn't want to fail to mention it because the differences in Genesis 1 and 2 have been, and I mentioned it earlier, a stumbling block for many people like in their faith. The inability to resolve some of the tension that's created by the differences in those two stories has shipwrecked people's faith. I don't want that to be you. I don't have every answer for every problem, but there are ways and there are many people um, doing amazing work. One of them that I would commend to you if you're really interested in this is an ancient Near Eastern scholar, a biblical scholar named John Walton. He wrote a book called The Lost World of Genesis. He's written several other things about this. So if you're if this is kind of getting your wheels turning and you want some more help than what I can provide on this particular subject matter tonight, then that's somewhere that you could look. But my main concern was that nobody would be shipwrecked by an avoidance of some of these differences on the part of the church. You have pastors and leaders here who actually want to help you. I grew up in a context, a very frankly fundamentalist context, some charismatic fundamentalism, some Southern Baptist fundamentalism. That's my background. And there was an utter shutting down of any kind of questions like these. If you try to ask about things like, why are, they, why are these different? It was just a total dismissal and a stuff those questions down. We don't really ask questions like that. And that's not the kind of environment that we have here at Vista, you have pastors and leaders who don't have all the answers, don't know everything about everything, but they're not afraid of confronting the hard questions. Um, Austin has also done some great work on this, generally speaking, in the last book that he wrote would be another great place I would highly commend to you. Um, and I get a shout out in that book, believe it or not. And so it's worth you getting the book just so you can see how I got shouted out. Thank you for that, Austin. So it matters because I don't want you to be shipwrecked. And then it really, really matters because I don't think you can understand the structure of Genesis chapter two unless you understand the structure of Genesis chapter one, which again is what God is doing to bring order into chaos. 
to, to do away with disorder, to make things that are not functional, functional. That's what's happening. And so there's these promises, this blessing in Genesis chapter one to uh, have this creation that God's created and to be fruitful and multiply. God blesses them. And so Genesis chapter two is actually about how that blessing is gonna happen, how order is gonna come into that chaos, right? And so let's look at it together. So that brings us to a garden, right? Genesis chapter two, I would love to read verses seven and eight and then verse 15. So Genesis chapter two, verse seven, this is not really my text, but I wanted to pull it in because it's relevant. Genesis chapter two, verse seven. This is not on the screen. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils from the dust of the ground and breathed the breath of life. And the man became a living being. And the Lord God planted a garden. Everybody say a garden. The Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east. And there he put the man whom he had formed. And then jump over to verse 15. This will be on the screen. A reiteration of what we just read. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden. Everybody say the garden of Eden to till it and to keep it. Say to till and to keep. This is God bringing order from chaos. The image bearing that Sydney talked about last month when you guys talked about Genesis chapter one, this is not exclusively in Genesis chapter two, but these are two, we're gonna talk about two ways, two very significant ways to bear the image of God in the world. And one of those ways to bring order into chaos, to make that which is non-functional, functional, is this vocation of image bearing, which in this case looks like tilling and keeping. Everybody say till and keep. Tilling is something like disciplined work. You're gonna to wanna to remember this for your questions, disciplined work. Keeping is something like concentrated focus and attention. Now, disciplined work, I think many people get um, but has there ever been a time in the history of the world that concentrated attention was in more short supply or more difficult to have on a regular basis? Concentrated attention to till and to keep. This is the shape that image bearing takes in the garden is tilling and keeping. Discipline work and concentrated attention. This is how order is gonna be brought into chaos. This is how non-functionality is gonna become functional. God creates a garden and he places the man into the garden for tilling and keeping. So a couple of things. One thing that's probably obvious to you but always lands on me like a ton of bricks is the idea of work and vocation, tilling and keeping, is pre-fall stuff. You ever thought about that? The things we're talking about tonight are things that are happening before the fall. That means that work is not a curse from God for humanity, which we tend to get the fall and we'll cover the fall in the next couple of months. But we tend to think about work being cursed and we just think work is a curse, right? Come on with me, anybody with me? Who thinks work is a curse? What if I told you that work is one of the ways that we bear the image of God when we do disciplined work and we pay careful, consistent attention to things and when we bring order into chaos and when non-functional things become functional because of our work, this brings glory to God and we bear his image in the world. Work actually exists before the fall. That means work is a blessing that means work is a gift from God. That means work is a privilege for mankind. Now listen, if you're thinking, well, I thought work was a curse and I thought work was cursed. You're thinking about the curse that comes after the fall and you're not wrong about that. But lest you remain in that mindset like some kind of um, fall mentality, like work is cursed, Jesus is undoing the curse, right? And so if you get stuck in some kind of um, fall mentality as you think about 
the dignity of work, the value of work, the gift of work, the blessing of work, you're stuck in a post-fall mentality and Jesus is undoing the curse of the fall. He's wanting to return us to a pre-fall mentality, namely that work is a gift. Bringing order into chaos is a beautiful and profound thing. And you get to be a part of that by the grace of God. Don't have a post-fall mentality about work. Eden is the sacred space where the presence of God is there in a very special, tangible, and profound way. And Adam and Eve, they fellowship with God in a very intimate and powerful way. And part of the, again, we're not going to get all into the fall, but part of the, the biggest consequence of the fall is the loss of that special presence and the loss of that really intimate fellowship. And even if you look at Israel's history, um, the construction of the tabernacle, uh, the construction of the temple of God, these things um, have these like hints and callbacks to Eden. The way that they're arranged is like an attempt to recover what was lost in the fall to get back to Eden in a way. And in Christ, as he's undoing the work of the fall, you may remember that um, your body is the temple of God, that the very presence of the living God indwells those who confess Jesus is Lord by the power of the spirit. And now this same Eden present, this same intimate fellowship is like present inside of a human body now. This full-fledged redemption has happened to get us back to a place of fellowship and intimacy and presence that resembles something like what Adam experienced in Eden, right? And so as we get into these questions, these first questions, one of the things that I want you to be thinking is, and I believe it's true, is that God has placed you in a garden. Everybody say a garden. We have this on the screen. This is from Paul in Acts chapter 17 when he was preaching in the Areopagus in Athens. One of the little lines from his message was this. I think we have it. From one ancestor speaking about Adam, or your translation may say from one man, God made all nations to inhabit the whole earth. And he allotted the times of their existence in the boundaries of the places where they would live. Another way of thinking about that is that God has dropped you into a very specific place at a very specific time. The Lord placed the man in the garden. You have a place that you've been brought into, this particular place. Some of you are kicking and I remember it very well, and resisting and downright hating the time and the place where you live. And one of the things I believe that the Lord would want me to remind you of is that actually the Lord has set the boundaries of the habitation of men and the times in which they live. And he has put you in a very specific place, a kind of garden where you're regularly as you probably well know, are confronted by all kinds of chaos and disorder and non-functionality. And one of the ways that you can bear the image of God is to embrace the place where he has placed you and to do disciplined work in that place and to have concentrated attention with the goal of bringing order out of chaos in partnership with God. Amen? So, questions. We have a couple. This is part one. There's another part. This was just the part about the garden. So I would love for you to talk a few minutes about this. There's two questions. We'll give you a few minutes. Do you need any other direction or any other thing for me before you talk about part one? All right, ready, go. All right, sorry to interrupt, but we won't get finished if we don't move forward. Is that a good discussion? I hope. Um, But I know you don't just want to hear about a garden. You want to hear about a girl. Everybody say a girl. So, Genesis chapter 2, and everything that we've talked about thus far is obviously still relevant now. We're talking about how God is bringing order to chaos on the earth. One of the ways that we just discussed is that God created a garden, a little particular space at a particular time for a particular person. In persons, we're going to find out, Adam and Eve. And he put the man in the garden in that place at that time 
to do discipline work with concentrated attention. And this is how order would be brought to chaos. Yes? So, but all the problems are not solved. Everything is still not functional. There's still disorder in the story. And so we have to look again, right? So Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, then the Lord God said, it's not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper as his partner. So out of the ground, the Lord God formed every animal of the field and bird of the air and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. Dude, this is one of my dreams is to relive this part of the story. I love animals so much. Sid just spent some time in San Diego. I don't know if you told everybody, but Sid was in San Diego. Uh, sorry to put all your stuff out there. But I was excited about that because it reminded me my 19th wedding anniversary is coming up in May. I've been married 19 years to Carrie. Yes, it's awesome. And I have a little boy named Barnabas that you might have seen with really awesome blonde curly hair and a daughter named Jonathan. He's eight and she's four. But anyway, 19 years ago, uh, roughly, um, my wife and I went on our honeymoon to San Diego. Do you know why? Because the San Diego Zoo is there. Because I have like a crazy wild love of animals. And this idea that these nameless animals are going to be brought before Adam to name them, but also to find a suitable helper, which is interesting. Probably don't have time to explore all of that. But he's going to get to drop these names on hippopotamuses and platypuses and, you know, the great horned owl. And I mean, you could just, the list goes on. It's amazing. I would love this. Whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. I wonder which one stuck or did not stick. The man gave names to all cattle and all the birds of the air and to every animal of the field. But for man, there was not found a helper as his partner. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman, a girl, and brought her to the man. And the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman, for out of man this one was taken. Therefore a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife, and they become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. So we, still, we have a big problem, actually, still in the story, is it is not good for man to be alone. This is a problem. There's still disorder. With every amazing blessing that God has provided, with every privilege and every gift and every just wondrous, immaculate, beautiful piece of creative energy that God has deployed, and you will know this, everything to this point has been good, and in some cases, very good. Guess what the first thing that is not good in the story? It's verse 18. This is the first time we have something that is not good. And what is it? It is not good that man should be alone. This is not good. We have disorder still. We have non-functionality and we've got to solve this. And so in the same way that God created a garden for man to, to till and to keep, right, as a way of bearing his image, the creation of the girl is bringing order into chaos, functionality into non-functionality, right? Just like everything that's preceded, this is the same structure, and this is exactly what's happening uh, here in the creation of woman. Now, this language is really interesting. I am not a Hebrew scholar, um, so please forgive me. I do the best I can, but also these words are a little bit complicated. Um, in my translation from the NRSV, it says, um, let me just say it right. It says, a helper as his partner in verse 18. And then again, it reiterates the same phrase um, in verse 20. It says, for the man there was not found a helper as his partner. Um, these Hebrew words, forgive me if I butchered the translation or the pronunciation, ezer is the word for helper. And some combination of words that I'm actually not going to pronounce is the word for partner. So ezer is a word that is not impossible for us to know what it means. It means helper, mostly. Um, it's really interesting when we talk about helper, some of the ways that you can see elsewhere where it's used in the scripture. So helper is used... Um, in a few different places to refer to neighbors, 
or family members who are providing help. This is in Isaiah chapter 41. Uh, it's used to talk about uh, a political coalition that provides aid and help. Is there, is used to describe the kind of help that they provide. Listen to this, this is really significant. It's used to describe military reinforcements in Joshua chapter 10. Is there, everybody say is there. Hebrew word is there, helper. And so helper, I think, is properly trans translated in most of our translations. Whose translation says helper? Does everybody pretty much say helper? I think that's pretty known, translated, not a big problem with helper. Two additional things I would want you to know about the word helper, which is used to ultimately describe the woman. Number one, it's also used about God, right? Is there Psalm 121? I lift my eyes to the hills. From where will my Ezer help come from? My help, Ezer, comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. Yahweh, the Lord, is an Ezer, a helper. Uh, Psalm 54, verse 4. But surely, David says, the Lord is my helper, is there, and the one who upholds my life. And so one of the things that I don't hear very often that I think is really significant and important, again, among many significant things that we could say about all of this, we could spend a long time on this story and breaking it down, all the little details. But one thing that I wanted you to take away, among other things, is that one of the things that comes with the phrase helper is actually strength. There's strength that's implied in the phrase helper. It's not just someone coming to serve. It probably is in some way related to that, but it's someone who's coming with help that's bringing their own strength to the party. Hello? That's really important. It is not good for man to be alone. And so God provides one who is a helper who can provide what is needed to help bring order out of chaos and function out of non-functionality, to help the man till and to keep. One comes to help, but that help comes with strength is how that word is often used in the scripture. That's really important to me that you would know that and remember that. The second word that's translated as partner, that's probably a good translation, but almost every translation has a different phrase. So it's like a helper fit for him or a helper suitable to him. My translation says a helper, that's his partner. I think that's a good translation, but there is no words that we can look up and see how that's used. Basically that, that phrase and the way that it's constructed is not actually used anywhere else in the scripture. And so it's very difficult to know exactly the sense that that phrase is used. But I think something like basically the combination of words is like the same, but opposite kind of. So it's someone who's the same, but different, right? And so it's a helper that's a partner. And so this is not an English word, but probably the best word uh, for this would be something like counterpartner, right? A counterpartner is provided because we still have non-functionality in the garden and that's not gonna work. It's not good for man to be alone. And so the Lord creates some animals, which is interesting and parades in front of the man. And that ends up, that does not solve the problem. We have a really awesome story about naming of animals and beautiful and wondrous creation, but we still have a problem is this thing is not gonna function as it should unless we have a helper that's bringing their own strength that also is the same, but not the same as well coming to the party. And that is much needed in order for this chaos to be ordered. Does that make sense? Counterpartner, everybody say counterpartner. Uh, it was not enough for man to rule and exercise dominion with authority given by God in the garden. Man was not just created for power, to be naming stuff, naming and claiming and doing his thing. Man was created for relationship with others. It is not good for man to be alone, right? He will not be ultimately fulfilled with power or authority. He needs a helper that provides her own strength that's like him, but also not like him. And together they will bear the image of God 
Together, that image bearing will take the form of like tilling and keeping and expanding God's creation in the garden. And together, the last thing I'll mention, it'll take the form in this case of marriage. This is a marriage text. Jesus refers to this text when talking about marriage. Um, I have a graphic, and I, I didn't want to say too much about this. I, just, I actually was interested. I won't be able to hear all of your discussion at all of your tables on marriage. Um, but a couple of things. We could derail on either end of this on marriage. It's not wrong to say that marriage is one of the mega themes of the Bible. It's not wrong, I don't think, to say that. The, the story of God begins with marriage and actually ends with marriage, if you're familiar with the end. So it's not wrong to say that marriage is one of the mega themes of the Bible. But if marriage is such a good and great gift, one of the things that I was interested in, in having you guys talk about at your tables is why is it plummeting so much in our society? There's a graphic that I brought just to show you that um, basically marriage rates have never been lower than they are right now, and they've always been going down since the early 1900s. I think we have a graph or a picture for that. No, somebody told me it was in there. Is it not in there? It's a wonderful graph with a downward descending line for 100 years. <laughs> and a little blip during COVID where it really plummeted and then kind of bounced back a little bit after COVID, but it's still not doing great. I wish you could see it. I'll uh, post it to Sydney's Twitter or something. Um, but marriage rates have been declining for a long time. So one of the things that it seems like marriage is not very valued in a sense in our culture. Um, so that's one end of the conversation that I think is relevant and important that I would love for you guys to discuss. Another end of the conversation is I've definitely been in context where marriage was idolized in a very unhealthy way where people did not talk about the call to singleness. That's a real call in the Bible. And people failed to mention that Jesus and Paul were single and they didn't have conversations around how the church could and should support singleness because they were overly focused in a destructive and an unhealthy way on marriage. So you can derail on both ends of conversation about marriage. And I tried to include both of those questions so y'all can work that out at your table. Okay, you're welcome. Um, before I let you do that, I really think that's all that I want to say. <laughs> I think you're going to need a lot of time to work that out, honestly. I could say more, but you need some time to work this out. So we have a number of questions. Um, only one question is on the screen at a time. Um, so I don't know how to do this because there's five questions in this section. Oh, perfect. Way to go, leaders. Way to lead. The leaders have all the questions. So, very quickly, leader, like, choose your own adventure. You don't have to go in my order. If you want to talk, start at the end, do it. Whatever you want. I know, I don't have the graph. Sorry. All right, y'all go. Questions. All right. I know Joel... Joel gave y'all a lot of different things to talk about, so you might not quite be done. Um, but feel free to get a screenshot of these questions from your leaders, too, if you want to keep thinking about this or go process it in your small group, because uh, these are just designed to be kind of a start of a, a big, much bigger conversation. This doesn't sure. have to be where we decide everything. But Joel mentioned something at our table that I kind of wanted him to yeah. end with. Sure. Well, I was just saying, like we had said that <clears throat> work was a pre-fall gift. Community is a pre-fall gift, right? The need for community to not be alone. It's not like a response to the brokenness of evil that comes after the fall. So we need community because we're really broken. It's like, no, community is inherently good and beautiful and was there in the beginning. In fact, if you're going to bear the image of God, you are bearing the image of one who exists as persons in community, in himself, in a perfectly good and beautiful way. So if you're gonna bear his image, it would be really weird for you to not, in fact, we would just say, you cannot bear the image of God and be outside of community because God's image inherently is persons in community. That's called the Trinity, right? 
That's who God is. That's fundamental to his nature. And so if we're going to bear the image of God, community is not like an optional thing. It's not something we do for a little while to kind of fix the ills of the world. It's like inherent to being a human being who bears the image of God. And you should share your illustration because it was perfect. With the, the yeah, babies? Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, I just, I heard a, a statistic about, ba- I don't, I'm going to butcher the story, no. but babies, um, they did this test and they provided them with all the nutrients they needed, but they kept them completely isolated from other human beings and the babies died because of their malnutrition. Or maybe they didn't die or they were like going they to were, die. Yeah. I don't know. Seems legit. No. So morbid. I'm also, I'm I, pregnant. Has Actually, anybody, yeah, listen. Has anybody heard this story? No. Joel is, heard it. I'm not crazy. There is, there is something. I've heard of it too about babies who don't experience like affection and community. That's why like um, actually it's a ministry at the hospital. There are drug babies who are born that don't have anyone to hold them. And like they want people to come and use their bodies to hold them and to love them and to care for them because they will not flourish. You can give them all the right food. You can give them all the right nutrients and all the right environment, but without human touch and human affection and connection to community, they can't flourish properly. Like we are so. literally made yes. to need human connection. And yeah. so first of all, like that's why we're doing spaces yes. like this, like the table, because we know that the young adult season can be a really isolating and lonely season and we want to help affirm the fact that we need community and create space for you guys to get in community and I also just want to affirm that if any of you feel alone you do not need to feel ashamed about that because again we are created and need community so do not feel ashamed about wanting people in your life or wanting relationships yes um so yeah I'm gonna pray for us and then I think Josh has a few announcements and I, I'm going to take her place. Um, Before you pray, can yeah, I say yeah. a benediction? Sure, I would love that. All right, can I say some words of blessing over you? Yeah, please stand up. And while we're at it, if you're willing, stretch out your hands in a posture of receiving. You don't have to, just if you want to receive this. This, this is our prayer Perfect. right here. Okay, boom, let's do it. You ready? May the Lord bless and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen? Amen. All right.